right, it's Tuesday at 10. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is what? Think Tech Talks. And we're talking with uh, Patrick Sullivan. He's the CEO of Oceanit uh, down the block, the other end of Fort Street Mall. And we get to see him here once in a while. And we get to, we get to look at his book, which is relevant to today's show. Uh, it's called Intellectual Anarchy. So welcome to the show, Pat. Nice to see your smiling face. Thank you. And thanks for having me. No, it's um, an exciting time. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of issues and challenges, but there's a lot of opportunities, too. And I think it's important for the tech industry to, to have a voice that's relevant to how we build the future. And now is a really good time to talk about it. Well, you know, um, medicine, uh, vaccines, therapeutics, all very important. And in fact, one of the headlines this morning was that Russia claims to, develop, to have developed a vaccine without uh, phase three testing. And uh, there's a certain level, a high level of skepticism in the medical, the global medical community about that. But you know, the immediate problem is testing. In fact, I saw a very interesting piece on CNN just yesterday with uh, Bill Gates, and uh, he echoes that thought. And he's putting money into this. And, and his idea is you really can't do much without testing. We have spikes all over the world now. Um, and the way to deal with spikes is testing and uh, tracing. So that's, and that's the immediate need. There's more immediate than anything else, testing. Right. And you're on it. I'm, I, I, I admire you so much for being on it, Pat. So uh, you, have, you have this whole philosophy about intellectual anarchy. I wasn't kidding about the book um, at Oceanit. And you have this, this other philosophy about letting your scientists come together and express their innovation. And gosh, they come up with stuff. <clears throat> so tell us about the origin of your spit in the cup testing that was in the newspaper last week. Well, as I talk about in the book, you got to sort of step way back um, to what we call pre-requirement. So right now you might say there's a requirement for a test, but a lot of the work started well in advance of that. Um, I would go back to about six years when we started a new kind of artificial intelligence, um, human style intelligence. And we did some work with um, uh, back then Office of Naval Research on this idea of small data, ambiguity, edge cases, things that machine learning is not good at, uh, things that are more human style. Uh, humans are good at those things. So we call it anthropomorphic artificial intelligence. So it's human style intelligence. So we started on that. And what began as maybe a kind of a crazy idea started to really bear fruit. We could do things, for example, um, we could look at malicious code before we knew it was malicious. Uh, like for example, uh, the zero day problem, right? So malware, uh, you have a, an application on your computer, it looks up uh, on a table to find if somebody sending you something is on the table, that's how it recognizes malware. What we decided to do was to see if we could understand the intention of the software. So the intention of code, again, it's back to this human style AI, considering code as a language. So we were really building what's what we now describe as a linguistic Turing machine. So it's a computer, but it's using the fundamental idea of language and associating language with human intelligence. So we, you know, what the theory is that what makes humans intelligent is the ability to have language and to communicate in any language. So we, we set out on that course back then looking at whether or not we could understand if code was malicious. Now, and, and that's in not just uh, C++, but hexadecimal and machine lang, you know, all kinds of stuff. Turns out we could do a lot. And then about three years ago, we thought, well, what if you look at um, human genome, um, you've got 3 billion base pairs with these letters. What if it's a language? What if it's not just a random string of things, but it actually is speaking about intention? 
together a program uh, with DARPA, actually. So once you do that, impossible to things that are very, you know, there's these interesting puzzle problems. And we got um, uh, the break. I'll, I'll walk through some of the things we did with that. Well, okay, that's a, a really remarkable way of looking at it. That's a different way of looking at it. Uh, and it does, it does resonate to think um, that the genome um, and all the elements of the genome are, are a language and they're speaking to us and they're speaking to you. Um, so you take that same concept and you apply it to the, the genome that we have. We have the genome of COVID and you look right. at what it says. What is it saying to you? Well, what it, what it basically said was, um, um, in our case, we produced the uh, a grammatical interpretation. And then we used that to create a computational model that said, okay, if I want to produce a sensor, what sort of arrangement of uh, a sequence and shape do I need to produce in order to, to create a molecule that is very unique to this virus that'll attach to it. Um, and so you reduce the problem then to this question of, um, it's like a 3D printing machine that'll synthesize a molecule. And then of course, you've got to put indicator attachments, nanomaterials and other things on the molecule in order to turn it into a sensor. That's essentially what we did. So we took the work we did over the last six years where we were able to distill it down to the, the grammar of um, RNA, for example, and produce a single stranded DNA molecule using the same tools with a lot of iteration. So we've collaborated with the University of Hawaii, the uh, JAPSA, to synthesize and test. So if you think of a 3D printer, you might print an object and then try it on and then go back and change it and you know adjust it and then try it on again and then go back and adjust it until you kind of perfect it. That's what we did. So we took what was maybe um, uh, two years of work and reduced it to a couple of months. There's a, there's a kind of there's a kind of social justice here. What I mean is uh, you know the the significant element of the coronavirus is it has these prongs that attach to uh, human cells. Um, and it, it rides on those cells and then does destructive work. Um, so the um, Helen of Troy sort of thing where you, you attach. And now, now what you're doing is, is you're, you're doing the same thing to the virus. You're attaching your, your nano uh, molecule to the virus and it's sending signals back to you. <laughs> you're, conceptually, it's very similar to what the virus is doing to us to what you're doing to the virus yeah well that's true so so normally what happens in producing uh antivirals or sensors is you try to discover something sort of hunting and gathering where you go out and you look for it in the amazon rainforest or at the bottom of the ocean and you test it and that's what makes that problem pretty intractable because you might be lucky you might be not lucky but we thought what if we could do it deliberately by design so you think more like an engineer than just scavenging or randomly looking for something we also include some of this this work in um, if you think of a darwinian evolution as these viruses evolve they're developed there's an efficient sort of kernel engine to what they do to become efficient uh, in this case, what makes this virus so dangerous, and, and you have to give the virus credit, is that it's very contagious in this asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic mode. So people don't know they have it, and then they go out and, and they share it with everybody, and it just spreads like wildfire. And that goes back to your earlier question about why is the test and what Bill Gates is doing. Um, but before we get to that, just to circle back to the book, because the book, I kind of break down how we do this stuff. There's a chapter called Left of Boom, but everybody focuses on the boom and that's the asymptotic spike that you see with growth. Everybody wants to see that hockey stick growth. Well, it's, what we do is these basic fundamental science questions start way left of that. And what we did was the kind of pre-requirement but we created a platform that we could then apply to a variety of things. In this case, 
we decided to really dig in and apply the tools we built to this question of uh, uh, the virus. And we thought we could do an antiviral, but we thought first a test would be really helpful and we could do that pretty quickly and produce them pretty inexpensively. And I think that's the big issue is a, a fast, inexpensive, accessible test because the, the biggest challenge we have now is that people focus on the uh, PCR test. PCR test matches a sequence with a sequence in a machine that amplifies a few strands of a virus. So from a forensic standpoint, it's a nice tool. If you're sick, you wanna definitively know what you got, it's a great tool. But when it comes to situational awareness, it's a, not the tool because you need lots of data. You need repeated data. So, so here we are. And um, I guess uh, we take a scraping or no, no scraping. You just spit. And that, that assumes that the, uh, the, the spit includes virus if you have coronavirus um, and you spit in a cup. And now you have uh, arguably the virus in the cup, in your, in your uh, spit. Um, how does the process work? in general, how does the process work to, I, to put these uh, molecules on the virus and then have the molecules sense the virus and send a message back so that we have some reliable way to determine there, yeah. is, there is virus? Yeah, so what we do then is we, uh, in the cup, we have a reagent. And the reagent, it's not that fancy, but we include uh, materials that, um, basically take, you know how you see these pictures of a, a spike protein and mm -hmm. on the outside of the virus, it splits the virus open and, and inside are all these little particles called nucleocapsid proteins. There's maybe a thousand more times inside than on the outside. That gives us a little more sensitivity. And then what we do is uh, in the cup with a reagent, we also have some little uh, nanoparticles and those nanoparticles are designed now with the uh, reagent that's in the, in the cup. And they hook onto, uniquely hook onto the nucleocapsid protein. So it's like a lock and key. And it only fits on this very specific design. And then with it, you have these little nanoparticles. And so when you pour them in this what looks like a pregnancy test, uh, you end up with a line because the, the material with the reagent, the virus and you know the proteins and everything flow through a little piece of paper and they hook onto this line. And so you get a red line and that red you line- can see, You can see the line. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. So the idea is that it's a really easy thing. You don't have special handling. You don't have, uh, you know, you don't have to refrigerate it. You can just buy them at Long's. Um, it's not expensive. You have paper and plastic. Of course, that costs money, labeling, all that kind of stuff. But to synthesize these molecules is not expensive. And then to uh, the reagent isn't really necessarily that expensive. It's very specific, of course, right? You have to have the right molecule, the right kind of nanomaterials uh, to kind of put, put it together like a Lego kit. And once you do, so you have the, 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 the molecule that's designed for the COVID, and then you've got this other kind of Lego piece you put on, which is, uh, uh, it, it's what gives you the red line. So, so, uh, so you go down, you buy this kit at, the, at Long's or wherever, um, and uh, does, does the kit include the cup or is the cup any old generic cup? Well, you put, the, you put the material in the cup before you spit into it or after, or doesn't it, or does it matter? So we're, we're, what we're doing right now, so some of the work with Queens, we put the uh, reagent in the cup. It's not very much. It's a little plastic thing. It's like a tiny little cup. And right now we're using a, a straw to spit in the cups. So you don't get spit everywhere. So there's all these little practical issues, but it's way easier than sticking a thing up your nose. And you can just kind of do this at home or you could, 
you know, we envision this being something that you could simply test getting off an airplane or getting on an airplane and show people that you're not making other people sick. Because to the question of, um, of the, uh, the issue that Bill Gates brought up, so when you're exposed to the virus, if you have adequate exposure, which is a question, so you gotta have, you gotta have enough viral material, then you're gonna peak in terms of expressing viral particles four to six days, we say five days. And you go up that curve, it's a really steep curve. So it turns out that the threshold for making you people sick is roughly around one times 10 to the six viral particles. Um, the limit of detection of a PCR test, which is very accurate, is probably one times 10 to the four viral particles. We're right around between one times 10 to the seven and one times 10 to the six. So within, let's say, six hours or less, maybe, of you being able to make anybody sick would definitely pick you up. And if you do this for several days in a row, we call it the Aloha Protocol. Ah, so I love it. <laughs> The Aloha Protocol, well, because it's not just enough to make a technology, but you have to operationalize it so you can impact humans and society to make everybody, you know, easily have access to use it in a way to the benefit of everybody. When you follow this protocol, you, you can eliminate infectiousness in the whole community. You run the math, you run the numbers, the simulations, you drive it to zero. But what you would do, for example, Hawaii is a great place because we're surrounded by a moat. Everybody has to fly in. So everybody walking off the airplane spits in this cup, do a test. If it comes out zero or clean, you're free to go. But for the next five days, you test. You spit in the morning. And if you're clean, you go. You take a little picture with it on a mobile phone and it just collects that data. After five days, you didn't bring in anything over on that airplane. Even if you started out on the airplane without anything and somebody was sick next to you, you didn't pick up anything. You're not contributing to anything. But I guarantee you're gonna find that person who tests because when you either on day two, see, you don't know when they were exposed. So within a couple of days of being exposed, you're gonna produce enough viral particles that we're gonna pick that up. So it makes it very easy to catch it. It's much, much cheaper, faster. You get a result in like 10 minutes and um, you know right away what you got. So you, you just, um, where does the red line appear? In the cup or you have to pour no, no, it out? No, it's, it's, on on little, it's on a little piece of paper. And so there's a little, it's, we call it a cassette, but it's a little piece of plant. It's a pregnancy kit is what it looks like. A lot of people, a lot of women know a pregnancy kit, maybe a lot of guys don't, but, but it's basically this little piece of plastic and inside is a piece of paper. And they, they may, in the case of pregnancy, they may, they may urinate or do something on it. In this case, you just spit. And, that, and the spit with this, you, know, you just shake it a couple of times, pour it in, and it just works like that. So it's very easy to use. Um, and the nice thing about it is that there's a, there's a line that says the test is working, and then there's a line that says you're positive or not. And you, that's it. So it's, it becomes really easy to, to track. So, and your, your, your point about the, uh, taking a picture with your smartphone, you can verify, and you can verify it with third person uh, exactly. what you're doing. So if, if the requirement, the regimen is... Uh, that um, you, you take the test in the morning then uh, and you're obligated to send in proof of it, you can do that with your smartphone. Um, that's really great. But, you know, question comes, though. I mean, I, we, live, we seem to live these days in a world of FDA approvals. <clears throat> and when it comes to testing, um, you know, the FDA takes a, a long time. I'm not sure what they're looking at because this is there's no damage can be done by the, the tests you describe. You know, that's impossible. All you're doing is spitting in a cup. Um, so the question is, what does the FDA have to look at? I guess it's efficacy. Um, and how long is it going to take the FDA to approve this to the point where you can go to market? Well, very good question. Uh, FDA has been really supportive. We've been talking to them for almost two months. We started out by explaining this idea of creating, 
we're kind of creating a new category. It's, an, it's called an antigen test, but what we're doing, nobody's doing. And uh, whereas, for example, antibody tests, you have to have something produce an antibody, a bug or an animal or something is what they typically do. This is synthesized. It's like a, a 3D printer. So they're telling us they can turn it around in 72 hours. And what they did was they actually sent us all the documents for the for the clinical test. So you have to prove uh, specificity and sensitivity. And we, you send back like how many samples you take and the conditions and settings you take them in. Then there's another provision that's to have a, a test that doesn't require going to a, a lab. This is an important distinction because they literally have a special category just for this. And the FDA point of contact has been really supportive. So they sent us a bunch of materials, but basically they said, look, you got to make sure it's usable by uh, at least one more language like Spanish speaking. You've got to have some uh, demographic uh, variability. So small, young people, old people, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Usability. So the, the basic three things we need to, to show, which we've already laid out a plan and, and our pretty well on that is sensitivity, specificity, and, and usability. Usability is just so you can sell it over the counter at Long's, you can have it at schools, you can have it at the airport, anybody can get it. And the key to doing this and really getting the, the, the infections, the virus under control in a community is a lot of testing that's accessible to a lot of people. So it has to be simple and fast, it has to be available. And in order to to really drive it into, you know, drive the virus into the dirt, we've got to collect five samples every yeah. day. Yeah. And if you do that, you're going to find out. Yeah. What What about uh, the cost? You said it was cheap, uh, and I've I've heard you know for the um, what is it the the other kind with uh, the swab up the nose um, cost a hundred hundred fifty dollars. My guess from what you said is this is. This is way less than that, and uh, the average person can afford to pay. Right. Although right. I don't know, maybe there's a system where the government can pay. After all, this is all uh, for the benefit of the community, and frankly, I think the government should pay. So to, to, there should be no barrier, no none at all, to taking these tests. Well, the the key, like what we've 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 actually had that conversation uh, with uh, some of the folks in the state, as we said. The, the big cost is setting up. We want to set up manufacturing right here in Hawaii because- Great, Pat, that's great. You can synthesize the molecule right here. Uh, you've got to control the room, so you have to have a clean room. You've, but these are all, th we're doing all this downtown. We just need to scale it up. Mm -hmm. So the going out is 20 bucks, but we think we could drive that down by with volume. And we suggested that the state acquire a bunch of them and that would help us get started with actually manufacturing right here and training up a bunch of people. So you figure everybody getting off the airplane does this. Uh, we've been contacted by some of the airlines. They wanna do it before they get on the airplane. Sure. Contacted by restaurants and hotels. Uh, they really wanna do this because they wanna make sure that they've got a safe environment and that they can operate. And what this will do this will significantly reduce the risk so that, I mean, effectively you can drive infectiousness in the community to pretty close to zero. <clears throat> this is so good. Oh, let me, let me, uh, there's a couple of questions came in. So let me ask you, uh, the people are watching, Pat, telling you now, um, what can the public do to help support um, Oceanist development of COVID-19 testing vaccine? Or testing or vaccine. Uh, what's your answer to that? I, I think you, I'd suggest you let uh, the governor and the, your elected officials know that you think this is important. See, there's one of the big kind of shifts in mindset here is one, one strategy is you just kind of wait in the dark and hope that something's going to change or that help is on the way. The other is we actually build a solution and we solve the problem and we go what I call from Hawaii to the world versus from the world to Hawaii. And so we think that 
this is an important time to show that we can make a difference from Hawaii. And it's a problem we can bring to the world because we've looked at, and we've been in discussion with a bunch of uh, scale-up partners, but around the planet, there's a need for something like this. And if we can do this in scale, we can reduce the cost, but it's a really good uh, opportunity, I think, to demonstrate how Hawaii can make a difference with science and technology, with innovation in a way that's, you know, back to the book you brought up earlier, intellectual anarchy. It is an anarchy. There's a process that goes from ideas, programs, projects, products. And I kind of lay out the whole thinking in the book mm -hmm. so everybody can see it. But the point is, there's a way to build a, an industry to make the world a better place, to create really good jobs. And this is one of those opportunities. Yeah. A couple of, a couple of loose questions here. Um, does the FDA participate in the setting of the price or is that, is that up to you, the state, the market, uh, cost? Um, how do you see that unfolding? Well, they don't dictate the price. But I think it's our responsibility to make it as affordable as possible because mm -hmm. I think there's a duty to, uh, I mean, if we can do something to reduce suffering and make the world a better place, I think that's what we need to do. So uh, what we're looking at is making sure that we can afford to do it, setting up the machines and the infrastructure to manufacture and building that next generation of people that can be part of, a, of an emerging medical industry, what we refer to as digital medicine. So it goes way beyond just uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, okay, so then you, you have, uh, I know you have laboratory space. Uh, I've seen it, I've toured it. Um, and I suppose uh, you can start there, but um, the thing is that when you, when you give a vaccine, um, what are there, seven billion people in the world, and every, every person gets at least two shots of the vaccine. That's the way it seems to be shaping up. So that's uh, seven times two, uh, 14, 1.4 wait, 14 billion shots. Okay, but when you're talking about a, a test, when you're talking about a virus that is out of control, when you're talking about all these people around the world that are infected, um, then it's, it's way more than 14 billion. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and your laboratory, um, in your laboratory on Fort Street Mall, can, can you make 14 billion times five? whatever, seven billion times five. <laughs> That's a good question. No, so what we're doing is the plan is to produce here in Hawaii right now about 25,000 tests a day. Uh, but according to a study of Harvard a little while back, they said you need just for the United States, maybe five to 20 million tests a day. Um, so we've, we've actually talked to and started collaborating with some scale-up partners, uh, companies in Korea, companies on the US mainland, uh, there's some companies in Europe. And so the idea would be to set them up with the molecule and the process from what we're doing here. Again, because there's nothing quite like what we're doing that is that easy for them to replicate. A lateral flow assay is what the test format is. That is understood. There's lots of little details. So the thought was get it going here in Hawaii get this uh, Aloha protocol rolled out so we reduce infectiousness in Hawaii and then go to the rest of the planet mm -hmm. and these other scale-up partners working. So for example, uh, Japan is interested because they've got the Olympics coming up. You could test everybody walking in the door. You could test all the Olympiads. Um, the visitor industry, travel industry, think about it. You've got 300 million people working in the travel industry. It's 10% of global GDP. It's not just Hawaii. So the entire travel industry could benefit from it. And the thought is to make it so that it's affordable, so that people can use it. The scale is enormous. So we would need lots of collaborating partners to do this. And we've, we've been talking to a bunch of them. So we're just trying to get it bolted down here in Hawaii. And then the scale up will go real fast. I'm so impressed with this. It's it's like all of the threads of of ocean it for the past. Oh my gosh! It, it must be uh, let's see, 
40 years already, you've been working on science and, and this really brings it all together. But I have one more question. Yeah. And that is, um, you know, it, it seems clear that Hawaii hasn't done much of a job on tracing. In fact, the country hasn't done much of a job on tracing. I don't know if there's any standard protocol on tracing, standard training on tracing, standard way of writing the data down and then using the data to actually take action on the tracing. <clears throat> now, one of the elements that, that would make, um, you know, the spit in the cup test uh, so powerful to stop, to, to stop the, uh, the virus before a vaccine is developed, even before a therapeutic is developed, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is, is tracing. And there you are, you're into information systems, you're into design thinking and artificial intelligence. I took a class, you know, once from you guys in artificial, <laughs> it taught me a lot. Um, <clears throat> so um, the question is, um, is Ocean thinking, are you thinking about a tracing system which is world, it's, it's information uh, technology, it's artificial intelligence. It would, it's the other hand clapping on the spit in the, in the cup test, isn't it? It is, and we've, uh, uh, we've tried to kind of stay in the background on that issue, but we, we actually built uh, one of the first global space situational awareness systems, it's called SSA. And so the suggestion was to apply the same basic thinking for uh, contagion situational awareness, but using, of course, uh, mobile phone as a collector of data, but you need to drive it all to a command center so that you actually know where you've got these outbreaks and you know where to put the resources and you know where you've got the flare ups and you know where all these things are. So it becomes a, an efficient, utilization of scarce resources to manage the risk and get people help that need it. And that also gives you an idea how to manage some of the hospital supplies and medical response and all those things. We've deployed a version of that with the, uh, uh, actually the state uh, uh, civil defense for hurricanes, uh, for, uh, we did a tsunami piece where you've got a, a mobile phone that becomes a collector, drives data to the command center, it goes to a central place, you put all that data together. We built about six of those over the years, everything from transportation infrastructure and Amtrak. It all started with a space work. And when we built this global center to track space 24 seven, all of space and drove data to a special place in, in, in a mountain, which I won't get into, but we literally invented this, this category a long time ago, almost 30 years ago. So that's the kind of thing, the tool set that you would bring to this. So it isn't just training people to call up, that's part of it, but it's actually the efficient use of information and then understanding from a, a geographic distribution standpoint, medical resource standpoint, and all the other resource, scarce resource standpoint, how do you deploy it to really efficiently support and protect the community? You're also perfectly positioned for that. <clears throat> Pat, speaking on behalf of the state of Hawaii, let me say we are so damn proud of you. Um, this, this will change the world. I hope you get the FDA approval really soon um, and that you can uh, play this out the way, you know, the way we all want you to. Well, thank you. And one, one last comment is, although I'm kind of a spokesperson, but the team that's involved is nothing short of remarkable. And they bring magic pretty much on a daily basis. So, and this rumor that you don't have talent in Hawaii is totally wrong. These are local folks that most of them grew up here. Uh, some of them have come lately, but the level and quality of talent is just unbelievable. And so for me, I feel really fortunate to work with this really talented group of people. And we'll fe we feel fortunate to have you in our community. Thank you so much. Pat Sullivan, founder and CEO of Oceanit. Thank you so Thank much. You. Aloha. Take care.